Hi, this is Mariah from Unpacking Disability and my cat Iki. And my daughter Max. Hi. And I wanted to preface the interview with Ellen Lajau because I made that um or hosted that interview back in April. So it's been quite a while since since we had it. And a lot has happened since then. And the interview is super awesome, as you would expect. She really talks about her journey as a parent with a disability. She talks about disability. She talks about um, raising her amazing daughter, Emily. And she she talks really about her whole trajectory. And I think it is um, a really interesting one. And I hope that you tune in. And I have nothing but gratitude to Ellen for being with me in that hour and for um, participating in this. And also, I'm really sorry it took this long to um, get it all together to post up. But I'm still really happy that I got it together at all. So, so yay. Max, you want to say bye? Bye. Bye. Do you want to say bye? Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. So let's start with quick questions. First, quick press. Quick questions. Okay. So, coffee or tea? Oh, tea all the way. I don't even like the smell of coffee. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Star Trek or Star Wars? Neither. I need a good tear jerking, a tear jerker drama. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite family show? Well, This Is Us is what we're watching right now. <laughs> Everybody, along with the rest of the world, yes. <laughs> What's at the top of your bucket list? Oh, wow. I don't really have a bucket list per se. I just. I guess maybe um, my next birthday is the big six zero, so <laughs> so maybe I just feel like I just want to be able to continue aging as gracefully as possible and being able to face whatever challenges come up uh, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I'm very, you know, this is a problem. What's the solution oriented? So, yeah. Okay. So, what would you bring? to the potluck. Oh, brownies. Everybody loves my brownies. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. So I'm wondering, can you introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about your family and your disability? Okay. Well, my name is Ellen Ladau and I have Larson syndrome and it's spelled L-A-R-S-E-N. And I only say that because I created the Larson Syndrome Resource Center dot com. So if you do have any more specific questions or want to learn more about Larson Syndrome, you can uh, go there. Um, and I do uh, put some information about my family, particularly in the genetics section, because that basically brings you back to the beginning. When I was born, um, I had a set of orthopedic uh, issues and cleft palate, and they, doctors basically didn't know what, what it was. Um, just told my parents it was random, you know, random birth defect. Uh, four years later, when my younger brother came along and had the same uh, issues, they realized it was a genetic condition. Um, it wasn't until I was preteen or maybe early teenage years that we found out that it was the name Larson syndrome, which um, uh, the word syndrome just means that it encompasses a lot of different features and not every person who has Larson's has exactly the same situation. But one of the major identifiers, I'll hold it up, I don't know if uh, people can see, is this shaped thumb. It's called a spatula thumb. Um, uh, it basically involves joint dislocations and bony abnormalities. Uh, again, I'll hold up 
I don't know if you're able to see, but I can't straighten my arm any more than that. Um, I've had a lot of knee surgeries when I was 42. Uh, I had to have bilateral hip replacement surgery. Um, so it's just a lot of orthopedic issues. I also, um, a lot of people with Larson's have uh, hearing difficulties. And I only, uh, even though that was an issue my entire life, I only started wearing hearing aids in about 2015, I believe, because I was um, trying to manage tinnitus, which is uh, another one of my uh, conditions, uh, and fibromyalgia. So <laughs> it's just a, a kitchen sink full of different issues, um, some chronic pain issues and so on. But again, not everybody with Larson's experience is the exact same uh, things. Mm -hmm. so. Wow, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Again, yeah. one of my really long answers. So cut me off if I'm going too long. <laughs> no, that's that's really interesting. I didn't know any of that. So it was that's very enlightening. Um, and I'm wondering about your so you know, I really wanted to to talk with you specifically because one thing that I've always admired is your daughter's, um, I mean, I don't know her very well. It's mostly just online stuff, you know, but she just seems to be unwavering in her um, steadfast, um, not just her, like her, her, her belief in herself, but in disability as a whole and in her commitment to, of course, the disability you know, rights movement and advocacy and all of that stuff. But it's to the extent that it really makes me wonder about you, her mom, and that empowerment that she must have received or, or in some way have like kindled underneath her. You know, she has a belief or in herself or a confidence that, that that to me has deep roots, like familial roots. And, and I wanted to ask you about your, your parenting journey, like you becoming a parent and, um, and if you always knew you wanted to be a parent, um, did you experience doubts and discouragement from your family? from friends or medical professionals? Or can you tell me something about that, like your background in becoming the mom that you are? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the very kind words about Emily. And um, I actually credit a lot of my disability identity from her. So we kind of, <laughs> so she, I believe that she taught me, but she'll tell you otherwise. So we, we, we just, we have a very close bond and yeah. yes, um, but my parenting journey. So the, the short version of the story is, is that since I previously told you that Larson syndrome is genetic, um, it was believed to be a recessive uh, genetic condition. Now, I know this isn't science class, so I'll just say that um, prior to uh, conceiving, I was and my husband was under the understanding that I could not pass Larson syndrome on to a child. So there was never a thought in my mind that she would inherit this condition because this is what medical people told me. Um, when I was 20 weeks pregnant, the sonogram suggested otherwise. They picked up uh, how they do this, I don't know. They picked up uh, palate issues and they thought a uh, club foot. At that time, it was obvious that, you know, this wasn't just a random occurrence, that she also had Larson syndrome. I was never discouraged from having a child. Uh, Prior to, you know, we just uh, uh, decided when it was the right time for us, um, my husband Mark, that is, and um, once we knew that um, Emily would have Larson's, um, the focus really just 
turn towards continuing to manage my pregnancy safely and her delivery safely. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there, there was, um, otherwise it was just, you know, an, a typical, because I don't really like the word normal, a typical couple just making the decision, you know, now we want to start our family. Um, but, you know, once we realized that Emily had Larson's, a lot changed. And I'll, I'll be really honest, and Emily has written about this. Um, I struggled a lot with guilt. Um, it was a very, um, very, very difficult time for me. Um, I probably had undiagnosed postpartum depression um, because, you know, when people think you have a reason to be a little depressed, they don't notice, they don't tell you. You know, I wasn't really offered help um, uh, other than family, you know, emotional support at that uh, in the early days. But um, it was it was difficult because uh, even though, you know, I knew that I, um, you know, did well in school and I went to college and I got married and I had jobs. There, there was still a lot about the disability experience growing up that was painful. It was very isolating. You know, I knew my brother was the only disabled person that I saw on a regular basis. And there was one other boy that rode the bus, the special bus to school, who um, I believe he had uh, spina bifida. But I didn't, I didn't have role models. So um, that, that I felt very isolated growing up. And also, um, as I admitted to earlier, I'm, I'm about to be 60. So there was no Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, you didn't see a lot of people with disabilities even out in public because, you know, there aren't curb cuts everywhere. So there were no people out in wheelchairs or walkers. It was just a, a very different um, growing up situation. And also I grew up in a pretty suburban area, you know, pretty um, isolated. And one of the main activities that kids in the neighborhood did was bike riding, which was something that I couldn't do. So uh, again, it was an isolating experience. Um, so I, I struggled with, oh my gosh, my, my daughter is going to have all these experiences again. And, and that, that was um, hard for me. And then um, they also threw on the fire that she had a very severe abnormal uh, curvature in her cervical spine and that she could um, die suddenly unexpectedly if from a, a, um, a movement that just was too much pressure on her spine or an accident would be even more risky for her um, and you know it just made a nervous mom even more nervous so here I am having my own disability and I can't even really get up from a chair without pushing off so I had to you know even come up with ways to you know care for her and then you put the oh my god don't drop her <laughs> you know it, it just put a lot of anxiety on me and she also had five trips to the OR before she was two so a lot a lot of stuff going on so mm -hmm. I dealt with a lot of that um, those issues but um you know, here we are, and she, she'll be 30 soon, and um, we, we have a great relationship. I think what she really learned from me is how to argue with insurance companies. <laughs> if, I, if I really can tell you the truth, I, I have um, my prior <laughs> experience when I was working. I worked for a health insurance company, and I also worked for a home health care company. So she, I just happened to have the right set of skill sets that you know i i was able to advocate for her in that way and i think she saw a lot of that growing up um which you know 
I, I guess she viewed as a positive role model. And she also had her uncle and a family that was, you know, very uh, accepting. And, um, and also, I, I don't even think it was a conscious decision by my husband and I, but we, we made it a point, although we sent her to mainstream school, and when she was old enough, and, and I found out about them, which is a, another point, uh, we sent her to summer camps for children with physical disabilities. And so I think she got a lot of uh, the foundation for disability identity from those experiences as well. And I wanted her to have a different experience growing up than I did. So. That's that, like Camp Jeanette, it seems like it's a, uh... Right, that uh, well, she, camp. Yeah, she went to um, a couple places. Actually, the first camp she went to is she was, oh God, I don't know how I did, even did this. You know, your whole life you teach your kids, don't talk to strangers, don't talk to strangers. And <laughs> drop, drop, okay, bye, see you in a week. With people should never even met. <laughs> it was very weird. <laughs> I uh, and when we picked her up, oh, and they wouldn't let her call or whatever. And when we picked her up, they they you know we heard she had a miserable time. So I was certain she would never go to another camp. But to her credit, the following summer, when she found out there were at least computers where she could instant message us, she decided she would go. And um, it, I mean, they were hot buggy miserable experiences so to her credit she she stuck them out and it was a very important uh, foundation for her that's awesome yeah. um so challenges um some of the challenges that what are some of the challenges that um well, the question is, what are some of the challenges of parents with your disability often experience or what disability related challenges have you experienced um, like you yourself in terms of logistical, systemic, ableism, microaggressions and so forth? Well, again, because not uh, every person with Larson syndrome has the exact same set of, for lack of a better term, uh, anomalies or symptoms. Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, like I said, I had difficulty uh, carrying her, lifting her. Um, when we lived in an apartment that was two levels, you know, made sure to have upstairs stuff and downstairs stuff to um, minimize going up and down the stairs. And, and that even got too difficult for me when I um, realized that she was not gonna be a stair climber. So we moved, you know, it, it's basically, like I said before, this is a problem, what's the solution? The steps were a problem. Luckily, we were in the position to be able to move. Again, that's not always an option for everybody. And uh, I consider us lucky that we were able uh, to do that. Um, so my main problems, I think, is just because um, a lot of more lifting than average and, um, because of her ambulation issues. So um, it, it, it accelerated what was already, you know, my back pain. I had stopped working when she was about, I think it was just after her second birthday because of so much back pain. Um, but the silver lining of that is I got to be home with her as she grew up, <laughs> but you know, to physical, the physical caretaking, what did put an extra strain on me. Um, the other major issue that um, I had um, is that I don't drive and uh, living in the suburban Long Island area, um, transportation was always a big concern. Um, Luckily, with you know my husband's support, um, understanding employers on his part, and uh, friends, and uh, we managed. <laughs> and now Emily drives and takes me where I need to go. <laughs> so yeah, full circle. Um, yeah, but uh, 
there were, I, I think, again, I think I mentioned isolation. I just never really felt like I fit in. I wasn't definitely not part of the PTA mom click. Um, um, I just, even, even though I'm a talkative person, I guess I'm maybe more reserved socially and um, just because of having so many experiences of being excluded that, you know, it, sometimes it gets hard to really put yourself out there because, you know, you fear, you know, rejection or not being included. But, um, but we, we, so it wasn't so much for me, but we really tried to make sure that Emily had as many experiences as possible. So again, that she wouldn't feel that isolation. Not to say that she, there weren't times when she obviously was excluded from events. Um, you know, uh, a lot of her friends' houses had steps and there reached a time when, you know, just not feasible. And again, we were lucky enough that we were able to um, remodel our house to try to make it, you know, so that our house could be the, the house where kids, she can hang out with her friends. So, it's, so, you know, you could tell she was also an only child. So, <laughs> um, I can't hear you now. I lost your audio. I'm sorry. That is a, that's helpful. I, I turned it on mute because I live by a big, busy street and the big trucks were going by. Boom. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that being an only child, I think is probably... Um, a little bit helpful there. Yeah, definitely the focus of our world. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then I was wondering about solutions. You've talked a lot about solutions, and that um, it seems to be that that's really your um, um, a natural sort of flow with you like problem solution problem solution you know like the challenge and the solution you just flow like right into the solutions but but yeah that was one of the questions was how was finding support from both within and outside the disability community um how did it help you address like the challenges that you faced as a parent with a disability disabled mom um and how can we all raise proud, strong, disabled kids? How can we learn from our experiences growing up with disabilities to help us in our current mission, which is raising, raising, you know, proud, strong, disabled kids? So well, I guess I'm wondering too about your, because your personal experience of growing up with a disability and how that framed your parenting style and how you raised Emily. Well, again, I mentioned before, first of all, I grew up pre-ADA. I also grew up pre-internet. So I think the internet um, has had a profound effect on even de the development of a disabled community. Um, and um, that, so you have the ability to reach out to other people who, you know, share your disability. So that in itself is helpful. Um, I, as far as my personal disability community, I only had that for a couple of years when she was in a preschool because she went to a preschool for kids with disabilities. Um, kind of as naturally happens, tend, you know, tended to lose contact with those moms uh, as Emily went to mainstream school. And as I said, I really wasn't the typical PTA mom. Uh, not that I didn't try. <laughs> but um, it, it's, I think the first thing you have to no is you know really being good at identifying the problem that you're having and um if you feel the solution is um out of your reach you you can't think of a solution reach out to people even who you don't think might have an answer because sometimes people who are outside a situation can see things more objectively 
Um, for example, while um, Emily was in preschool, transportation was becoming an issue because you know, there was only so much my husband could take off from work. And um, so I, I spoke to her teacher. Who, who, who would think that the teacher would know anything about you know, transportation for people with disabilities? But it turns out she referred me to the school's social worker, which at the time I didn't even know they had. And she was able to um, hook me up with a transportation service. It wasn't great, but something is better than nothing. So again, reaching out um, to people, even if you don't think they um, have an answer. Um, okay, of course, now with the internet, reaching out to parents with kids, you know, whose ch child shares a similar disability. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no secret sauce. Uh, I'm not gonna sit here and, you know, call myself parent of the year because I have a well-adjusted child who fully embraces her, her disability. Um, it, there's so many factors in parenting that, that I don't even like to use the word successful parenting because it, Every, every parent and child is different. Your relationship's gonna be different. It's affected by so many, so many factors, socioeconomic, family factors, whether you have family support, whether you don't have family support, whether you know it's a, a parent who's struggling to make ends meet and having to work two jobs, as opposed to me who was able to be home and you know nurture my relationship with Emily. So the, <laughs> I hate to say it, but you know, it's a crapshoot. <laughs> I will, there is there is no one answer to that question. I wish I could give you one. I'd write a book and be a millionaire, but um, there isn't. Uh, it, personalities have to have to click. I mean, my daughter has friends who don't have any disabilities, at least visible ones. And she tells me that they don't get along with their parents, you know? And I think that's terribly sad, uh, but you know, that happens and all in any family, the risk is there. So I just think do the best you can, reach out to whoever, you know, you remotely think can be supportive and um you know uh if you need family therapy to help you work on some issues you know go for it if that's a you know feasible you know there's like i said not one one answer yeah i i think that's why it's, it's true it was just so many things affect it I mean, there's so many things. It's just, um, so resources, tips, hacks. Um, are there any that you would, um, would like to share or any aha moments in parenting that really, um, really come to the surface for you? Like things that you really like, oh, you know, well, I think my aha moment, if you want to call it that for parenting, was when I realized how my daughter, you know, um, embraced her disability identity. And like I said, that wasn't even a thing when I was growing up. So that's what I mean when she, she introduced me to disability culture and, you know, disability as an identity. So I think... Um, that was the time when I really started to feel I could let go of some of that, you know, long held on to guilt. And I'm not gonna say that there aren't little snippets of it that rear its head every once in a while, you know, any parent, you know, will feel upset if their child is upset. But um, I think that was a, an important time in our life. And um, hacks, Hacks is, is just whatever the problem is, I had to figure it out. Like something as um, 
mundane as being able to pick up things. I tend to drop a lot of things. So everywhere around my house is either a, a reacher or a set of kitchen tongs, which actually work better. Um, I came up with that or a problem with door closing, you know, long stick with a zip tie on the end of it to pull the doorknob. Um, I had trouble with putting on my shoes and I had a um, problem pulling out the, the tongue of the shoes. Um, got a duck bill, a long handled duck bill pliers and used it. You know, it's just like I said, whatever problem Emily and I faced when nobody able-bodied was home to help us out or rescue us, dare I say, um, we figured it out and, and we help each other. You know, there are things that she can't do that luckily I'm able to do and vice versa. So, um, but, uh, so it's so much just is going to depend upon what your your particular child's needs are and you know what your disability is in terms you know uh, a quadriplegic parent is not going to be able to put shoes on a disabled child who can't do that so I mean that sounds harsh but you know maybe figure out other ways of teaching the child to do it by themselves or, you know, you have uh, some other caregiver. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm struggling to, to give an example and I'll probably get blowback for that example about the quadriplegic person. Um, but I was just trying to be realistic also, I think that's important, being realistic and what you can and cannot do and not beating yourself up for what you can't do. Yeah. And just finding ways to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I don't have all the answers and there are still a lot of things that Emily and I um, need help with doing from you know her, her dad, my husband. So it isn't. There isn't an answer for everything, but you, you just try the best you can. <laughs> makes total sense. It really does. Um, there was, I, I was really wondering about when Emily was leading the way with the disability pride and, and teaching you about that and, and about, um, disability culture and all of that how did that feel for you and how did she get it how did where did she get it from ah uh, where did she get it from well i think some part of it you know, she did absorb from seeing me like advocate for her and other, um, I think her summer camp experiences also gave her um, that sense of, you know, I, there is a community of people with disability out there and I will belong to them. And I think how she went on that path sort of happened accidentally almost. She's almost like uh, the accidental advocate. Um, she, um her, <laughs> sounds like I, I i think so because her cousin her cousin invited the two of us to a disability awareness day at her high school and um emily couldn't have been more than eight and uh, there were other panelists including myself and emily stole the show and she knew it <laughs> and um then as a then as a result of her uh going to camp she got an invitation to audition for sesame street and she appeared on several episodes of sesame street um to educate um, the audience about life with a disability and how even though you do things differently, you know, you, you can just still be one of the neighborhood. Um, and I think that experience 
Um, although it wasn't a light bulb moment for her, I think it's something she always sort of carried in the back of her mind. And then when she, when she was in junior high, she um, asked if we would um, support her in having a, uh, a disability program at her school where she would answer questions that all of students in her grade wanted you know to know about disability and she went to the principal's office and she presented the idea for the program and and they had it and um so it was just gradual and in the meantime all along we thought she wanted to go to college to become a high school english teacher and i think her college experience too having to you know, work with the school and advocate for, um, hey, you know, uh, I need a working elevator here. This elevator has been a problem or this, this area of the campus where I have to travel is, you know, really could be smoother or needs a ramp or a better curb cut. I think she just naturally, it sort of just naturally evolved um, for her. And then she, you know, she announced that she wanted to become a disability rights advocate. We're like, I didn't even know that was a job. <laughs> I didn't know that there was this community. And, but she, she found it. We, again, the internet's an amazing thing, the research. And um, not a week after she graduated college, she went on an inter internship with the American Association of People with Disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, um and I just credit her her fortitude and her perseverance and I always say now I'm riding on her coattails she's she's not a high school English teacher but she's a teacher of a larger classroom and um I think I'm her first student so oh. I'm, I'm very lucky <laughs> I'm very oh, lucky <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm going to tell her I made you cry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that's... She's, she's working in the living room doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Tweeting some meeting or running a webinar or whatever. <laughs> so, so, doing work. Yep. Yeah. But Ella, thank you so much for this time with me. I truly, truly appreciate it. And I'm just so glad that I got a chance to talk with you and get to know you a little bit. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I hope I didn't talk off your ear. You um, <laughs> and if you have any <laughs> any other questions that you think uh, I could answer, you now know how to find me. Oh, uh, not right. I mean, I, I do have a lot more questions, but then it would be a five hour interview. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, that, well, that's the thing. Remember when I said I didn't like feel like a, you know, typical PTA mom, I think moms, uh, you, you need some, some common bond, I think, to just click with people. And I always found that I could click right away with a parent who, who had a child with a disability. And it doesn't matter what the disability was, it can be completely different than what you're dealing with, but there's just something about that experience that makes it much easier to have a, a point of connection. I well, actually, that does bring me to a question that I did have, oh, um, sure. which is what, what do you think, what is your opinion and what do you think about what the greater kind of cross disability parenting community i really like focusing more on moms rather than parenting just because of that's my own experience you know as being a mom so um what do you think the and i also feel like us moms with disabilities we have very specific issues sometimes that i don't think dads with disabilities have as much especially biological moms because you know just the whole physical piece of creating a child with our bodies you know um and i'm wondering what do you think that greater cross disability mom community would really benefit from in this point in time 
Oh, boy, that's a question. I don't know if I have a answer right off the top of my head. I... Hmm, you have me stumped there. I think um, just being a support and even though your child may have a different disability than the mom you're meeting in the pediatrician's office, um, you know, well, what services do, does your child get? How did you get that? Where do you find support? You know, I think uh, moms or uh, parents with disabilities, uh, uh, like I said, have um, an easier time talking about these issues than, you know, the, the stranger who just comes up to you and says, what, what's happened to your child? What's wrong with your child? And that, that's kind of off-putting to start a conversation. But if I see a parent who's a child with a disability that I may um, know something about, or even if I don't know something about, you know, I feel like I have an easier time starting a conversation. And then, then things just tend to flow. And then before you know it, you know, uh, whether the child got PT, OT, speech, <laughs> whatever, where they got it, um, what school's better, you know, just the same kind of uh, stuff that every parent start, talks about. What extracurriculars, you know, like we found out uh, about um, adaptive dance and, you know, so there, it's just being using that community just to soak up information. Mm. Thank you. And if you have anything to add, I know that's an enormous question I just threw at you and I'm really, you know, I, I wish I had thought of it before, um, but it is something that's kind of like deep in my heart kind of question that I really am so deeply curious about. And if you do think of anything more to add, can you just email me and then we'll include it in the, in the blog post. Sure, why don't you, if you don't mind just typing out that question for me again, because I, I really have to study it. <laughs> and then I can hopefully try to email you some kind of reasonable reply. Yeah, so. Okay, then thank you again so much. I, I just so appreciate your time and your willingness to meet with me and, 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 talk about this i just really thank you no my pleasure uh i never never give up an opportunity to talk about my daughter she's the light of my life <laughs> <laughs> oh and uh, just because i don't want to be a hypocrite yeah. you know i keep telling her she has to self-promote she does have a book coming out in september right on. yes demystifying disability and it is available for pre-order now. And when she sees this, she's gonna <laughs> kill me, but. <laughs> no. can, you, can you send me the link so I can include it in, in the in Sure, the and I'll also send you the link to the Larson Syndrome Resource Center in case anybody wants to learn any more about Larson Syndrome. Thank you. And um, I'm probably, when I, when I post this though, I'm gonna edit this video just so that It'll just contain like the nuggets of, of information. Okay. And um, just I, just let me know when it's available to, to watch. <laughs> and it's going to be in May, like yeah. in the first week of May. Yeah. So I'm going to do on you're the, my very first interview. Thank you. So I'm going to do <laughs> an ongoing series. I'm, I don't even think I'm going to stop in May, actually, just because that's, it's such an interesting subject. I think it's, but you know, Mother's Day, so yeah. Oh, yeah, logical tie-in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I wanted to say, because if you're, you said you're well, your sound just so you, broke up. We're I, the same time. Wait, your sound broke up and oh. I couldn't understand what you were saying. Oh, oh sorry. Um, I, you said that you're turning 60 this year. So I think you are also an ox. I think we're the same sign. Uh, an ox? Oh, in Chinese New Year? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Are you uh, an ox? I, I don't know. I only knew that I was Gemini. 
<laughs> I didn't know. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you are, because because I'm 48 this year, and you would be 12 years older than me. Would be the same sign. Oh, okay. Now, are and, you from Hawaii, or did you move there? Or? I'm I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh -huh. And then I moved to Fiji when I was seven. And then I moved here to Hawaii when I was 13. So I grew up here. Oh, okay. And then after my divorce and, and all this stuff in California, I wanted to raise my kids where I had been raised and where I had high school friends and stuff. So I just came back. Oh, okay. Emily told me that your disability is um, that you're deaf. Is, is that correct? Deaf. Yeah. Yeah. So and, is this yeah. a cochlear implant? No, I, I wear hearing aids. Oh, and okay. I, I wear hearing aids on. also. What is the, if I may, yes, I see something like on your clavicle? Uh, like oh, this, this one, um, it's not actually on right now because I'm just using the, the live captions from Zoom, but this one goes, connects it to the computer for sound, like when I'm in class and the phone for sound. Oh. Really great. What kind of hearing aids do you have? Well, just Widex. Um, I just, I needed a canal lock because yeah, I yeah, yeah. Do yeah. all your canals. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, should, you should be able to get something like this as well, or it goes directly from your hearing aid into the phone or the computer. So yeah, these are these are Bluetooth. Okay, yeah, it's the same Automat thing. Yeah, so if I have the Bluetooth on in my phone, I it goes and I can adjust the volume of my hearing aids through the phone. It's amazing what the phone can do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, actually, that was something else I should have mentioned in the interview. I didn't really talk so much about my hearing issues also. Yeah. added to my sense of uh, social isolation and we didn't realize that I should have had hearing aids as a child yes and, oh wow and I think that not and I wish I had a wheelchair as a child yeah um no but it really does though and you know they've said it I have a lot of blind friends and and in the bay area and they've said that that is it's you know that they thought that that being deaf or hearing impaired in any way or having a loss of hearing would be worse than in terms only in terms of of being um as isolated as we get the, the reason they were saying this is because everyone freaks out about being blind but in reality it 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 seems because because of the hearing you're able to actually participate around you more often than people who are hearing impaired because everyone looks at you and they think that you hear and that you're part of it and you're able to jump in but you actually don't so yeah uh i know no no disability olympics so i didn't mean to bring that in into like oh no no it's not disability yeah. I, I, I totally understand that but i think now um you know i'm, I'm really uh, I've been able to look back and there's so many things that I wish, you know, and no, no disrespect to my parents. They didn't know yeah. the, the camp that Emily went to is over a hundred years old. One wow. of them, my parents didn't know about it. And there was again, no internet to research this and whatnot. So, um, uh, I just went to a regular summer camp and sat and broiled in the sun while everybody else was playing or I was a scorekeeper. So, oh. yeah, no, so uh, adaptive physical education or adapting sports, is, it wasn't a concept back then. So, yeah. I, again, our, uh, 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 my growing up and Emily's growing up is really a study in contrast. So, I think. Yeah. This is Angela. Hi. This is my youngest Hello. Mac. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Oh, oh, you too. <laughs> I'm all the way in New York. Have you heard of New York? Yeah. It's, yeah. I think it's the opposite place of San Francisco. Uh huh. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. far away. But I've never been to Hawaii. I hear it's 
really beautiful. It is. <laughs> you gotta come. It's really cold and kind of miserable right now, but it's it. it, it come when it's warmer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's been um, our weather is sort of like a roller coaster. It's cold one day, warms up, gets cold again. So it's like uh, I don't know, you know. Every day it's like, oh, what should I wear? <laughs> you know, it's just, and it's been very windy here. Uh, I'm, very, I'm kind windy. of scared. I'm kind of scared of living in New York because it, because I heard it, it gets a thousand tornadoes a year. A thousand, a thousand tornadoes? tornadoes? A thousand no, what? Tornadoes. Tornadoes. Um, tornadoes? There are some tornadoes, but New York is not the, not one of the areas of the country where are, there are the most tornadoes. Unfortunately, um, those are other areas of the country down south or in the middle of the country. But we could get some really big snow storms. Have you ever seen snow? I want snow. He wants you want snow. snow? <laughs> uh, you could have some of ours when we get it. That's <laughs> me shoveling it. <laughs> Next idea of a dream vacation is to go to Canada in winter. Oh, yeah. Winter? I thought you wanted the snow. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, well that's winter. Oh, I thought it. I thought it snows all the time there. He he thought it snows all the time in Canada. Oh no, I think they have seasons too, but yeah. yeah. Well, it does. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I got I got to get these kids to school now. Isn't that okay, funny? Okay. Yeah, I told you I talk a lot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, so I'll send you those two links. Thank you so and much. And you'll send me that last question. That I will. <laughs> okay. okay. Really pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.